Welcome to the 12th Taisic Talks. Uh, we, uh, I'm here no, uh, as a co-host for Marie Postma. My name is Peter Sponk. Normally, Emil Arts is sitting in this chair, but he couldn't be here today, so I'm taking over for him. Uh, may I ask the people who are currently uh, in the in, in the, 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 the in the in the link in the Zoom call? Uh, to turn off your screens, you all have that, that's good, and keep your audio off, uh, because that would disturb the, uh, the call here. Um, we will have two speakers today. Normally we have three, and that tends to be a little tight, so now we have a little bit more time, and hopefully we can go a bit more in depth for these talks. We will not go on longer than six o'clock, so this really will be between five and six o'clock. If you have comments during the talks or you have want to ask the speaker some questions then write them in the chat we will keep track of the chat and we hopefully can get to these questions at the end of each of the talks and maybe a few at the end of the two talks Marie, over thank to you. you thank you peter so welcome everyone let me introduce the first speaker for today that's uh, philip brown Philip Brown is a PhD researcher in uh, the final stages of his PhD project uh, that is being completed at the Department of Cognitive Science and Artificial Intelligence here in Tilburg uh, under the supervision of Wendy Powell. Uh, his project focuses on the use of VR in various settings, primarily with medical applications in mind. Um, and uh, as you may know, there's currently a lot of interest in VR applications. And, um, there is a great potential uh, for, uh, for these uh, developments, for instance, in areas such as education, uh, health, and marketing. Now, what a lot of people don't realize until they start working with VR is that uh, one of the issues that VR researchers run into is that a lot of users experience uh, motion sickness, uh, cyber sickness, while using virtual reality applications. Uh, so this is an issue because uh, it concerns about 20% of um, a normal, uh, normally developing uh, uh, population. And there are certain groups that are affected um, even more. Uh, Philip in his research uh, focused on cyber sickness in uh, particular patient groups um, and uh, came up with results that are relevant not just for his own research, but for all, uh, um, for all of us who do uh, conduct studies in VR environments. Now, one thing that uh, I uh, really had to extract uh, from uh, Phil was uh, information about his hobbies. And you know that in these Dysic talks, we like to also uh, dive into uh, some of the personal interests of our speakers. Uh, Phil likes to go for walks. He likes to listen to music, but he uh, didn't like to share information with us about which bands he likes. <laughs> so that's something you will, you will have to ask him personally. But he does like to play board games. And actually next to me, I have our, <laughs> our university board game expert, uh, because Peter is uh, not just conducting research on games and serious gaming, but he also organizes a lot of game events uh, at Tilburg University, one of them being a board game night um, Peter, is there something you would like to say about these uh, meetings? Well, the board game nights, we try to do them live, uh, usually in the Depre building in the center of Tilburg. Um, we had to stop them for a long time for the last two years because of COVID, but I intend to very soon start them up again. So uh, if you are interested in joining up, leave a message in the, in the chat and I will write down your name. And if you do join, then you may also find out about Phil's favorite board game that currently, uh, that I understand involves uh, animals and uh, dealing and organizing animals or <laughs> confining animals. Okay, so that much about uh, Phil's background. Um, Phil, please, the floor is yours. Tell us about your research. Thank you, Marie. Hello, everyone. Thank you for the lovely introduction. Um, my name is Phil Brown, Phil or Philip, whichever you prefer. And I will be talking to you today 
the title was a bit messed up, unfortunately. That should say uh, recognition and interpretation of pain and cyber sickness in virtual reality. Um, I'm a PhD student in the Department of Cognitive Science and Artificial Intelligence. And I'll try and give you a quick about me. Um, PhD student with Dr. Wendy Powell. Um, I transferred here from Portsmouth, UK in July 2020 uh, during the pandemic. Um, I previously worked as a research assistant at Portsmouth University, um, where I was working on projects such as VR molecular visualization and also VR meeting spaces for adolescents. Um, my primary research interest, which I'll be speaking to you today about, is pain detection and alleviation and cyber sickness detection and interpretation. So first off, I'll sort of give you a real quick whistle stop tour um, of the background of it and sort of dive down into the work um, which is focused around my PhD. Um, firstly, in general, about uh, pain. So how we actually process and how, why pain distraction, why virtual reality, sort of consequences of that and the sort of problems I'm looking at uh, answering as part of my work. Um, so the easiest way I think of thinking about pain is that with our bodies in general, we send signals all the time. Some of these signals will be threatening, some of them are going to be non-threatening signals. Um, and in the case of pain, if you hurt yourself or something happens which sort of knocks a stimuli, you're going to be sending a signal to your brain, which is then going to send a signal back and try and give you a defense mechanism to try and make you not do it again. Now, with virtual reality, where that comes in is based on something called gate control theory and how we can distract ourselves from pain. So in Lots of circumstances with pain. Um, you could take medication and things like this. However, there are also not more uh, non-pharmacological interventions that we can use, and pain distraction being one of these. Um, traditional methods aside from going into the virtual reality, you can think of um, films, TV, reading books. Um, and the idea behind this is that you can then provide non-threatening signals rather than threatening signals. And then what gate control theory proposes, and then this is how we are, we'll slide into this, is there's an image on the right actually that might help explain some of this is that when we receive these threatening signals and it travels up our spinal column to our brain to receive this uh, signal these theoretical gates will open and close if it's a painful signal this theoretical gate will open and then that will send back the painful response if it's a non-threatening signal then it might it will hopefully keep the gates closed more often and that's what we're trying to achieve we're trying to keep these gates closed so therefore we reduce the sensation of pain that the user is experiencing so why VR and what sort of happens in VR? VR is fantastic at producing these non-threatening signals, so therefore keeping these theoretical gates closed more than they are open. Um, and we put this down to the sense and the elicitation of presence, which VR is fantastic at. So if we are able to place ourselves elsewhere other than where the uh, painful stimuli may be, and we are able to immerse ourselves in other environments, then we hope to be able to increase the sense of presence, thus reducing the, the threatening signal which are being listed. The consequence of this is that virtual reality also makes people feel sick, called cyber sickness, also referred to maybe as a simulated sickness, visually induced motion sickness. But the idea is that they are symptoms similar to motion sickness. So um, if you've ever tried virtual reality, you may know yourself, um, but you may feel sort of dizziness, nausea, um, headache. Um, and this cyber sickness interferes with our sense of presence. So it's doing the opposite of what we want it to do. And instead, we are um, producing more of these threatening signals, not enough of these non-threatening signals. Our theoretical gates stay open, the painful signal is being sent to us, which is undesirable. Um, and a bit of a sidestep here, but I think important to my work, especially how I'll explain it, um, is how we actually measure pain and cyber sickness. And most of these are done using self-report methods. Um, there's an example of a pain self-report method on the right, just below the other diagram. Um, and we use scales. So normally for pain, for example, you can use stuff like numerical rating scales, visual analog scales, where you'll ask the participant or patient on a scale of one to 10, how are you feeling? And they'll give that answer. Um, cyber sickness, similarly, um, there are a few different methods, um, mainly self-report once again, although the most prominent being the simulator sickness questionnaire, um, 16 points uh, questionnaire, scale of zero to three asking you um, on a scale of severity how bad a certain symptom is, such as, like I mentioned earlier, dizziness, nausea, uh, headache. So what problem am I trying to achieve in my work, knowing all of this information? Um, well, I initially went into this work um, from the perspective of what role VR has to play in distracting people from pain. So initially, and you'll see from my first study, which I'll go through in a moment with a couple of publications that came out of it, was concerned with what about VR is actually causing this distraction 
we hypothesize and we theorize about the present side of things and that if we feel more present, maybe we can provide more distraction. However, is that enough? What, what about the media is actually distracting? Do we need something engaging? Do we need something interactive? Is something passive actually able to produce this same um, analgesic? Um, and then from that, um, with the results of that study and what I've gone on to now and what is forming the final stages of my thesis, is actually why we are using self-reports and maybe how we can look for alternatives to this. A um, number of reasons for this, and especially that I found through my own work, let alone the literature itself, um, it can be quite unreliable, it can be very subjective. Um, it can lead to bias, especially from experimenters as well. Um, we can get gender bias in there. It can be quite undesirable, um, especially from a self perspective. Um, it's quite hard to actually ask someone during an immersion um, how much pain they are in or how sick they are feeling. Um, once again, that sort of ties back around to breaking the sense of presence, therefore reducing the pain, et cetera. Um, and then also unfeasibility, um, very time specific. If I ask you post intervention what has happened to you, you are using almost like a memory recall to tell me what happened. I don't understand what actually happened at that time. So there's a number of things around this as to why I am interested in using alternatives to self report methods. So into my work to date, um, I will break this up into sort of publications which have come out of this thus far. Um, but the way I'll try and construe this to you is that the, there was a small study which I did initially, which I spoke about where it was examining VR's role as a distractor among persons. And this was specific with people with persistent and chronic pain. Um, further from that, with the work that came out of that, um, we are actually noticing um, irregularities, especially in cyber sickness reporting. So we made a further publication where we were looking at the extrapolation identification that the current theories concerning cyber sickness reporting um, may be incorrect. And then thirdly, during the pandemic, when uh, human participant research wasn't able to go ahead, um, we actually elaborated on these results further. Uh, we conducted a survey-based study where we were examining uh, potentially incorrect assumptions for cyber sickness baselines. Um, so I'd like to go through this a little bit more in depth with you anyway and sort of discuss some of the results that we got from these. Um, the first publication from this small study we did um, was titled Virtual Reality as a Pain Destruction Modality for Experimentally Induced Pain for a Chronic Pain Population. Um, we had two hypotheses from this specifically. Um, we were looking at whether the pain tolerance would differ between active and passive interventions, um, of which we found that people tolerated pain um, significantly greater in the active compared to a passive intervention. Um, and then secondly, whether presence would be positively correlated um, with the pain tolerance. Um, so in this regard, we found a significant positive correlations um, between uh, presence and the active intervention, and then similarly, no correlation between pain tolerance and presence passive intervention. Um, and so this answered the initial question I had with part of my thesis, or certainly started to build upon that, which was, what about VR do we need? Do we need it to be engaging? Is it enough just to wear a headset? Is it enough to, uh, what part of this do we actually need to identify as being the distractor? Um, and in this case, it was very clear that um, the medium of VR itself isn't a sufficient distractor, and that the media is, is actually important to this. But furthermore, especially with the work that I'm doing now, what was identified is that the use of self-report questionnaires um, is not necessarily ideal methodologically, and this sort of builds into my next publication, which I have. So the following publication based off the same uh, data set the same participants uh, was titled Pre-Exposure Cyber Sickness Assessment Among Clinical Populations of Virtual Reality. So as a quick background again, when you administer something like the SSQ, if you're not familiar, um, that's a similar sickness questionnaire. Um, you will traditionally ask them post-intervention and you use a pre-intervention assumption that people are coming in with a zero baseline score. So you can assume that everyone is feeling perfectly healthy before they go in, in lieu of some experiments which may ask people um, or may actually exclude participants if they are feeling anything other than healthy, which you can imagine with a baby, a pain uh, population isn't indicative at all because you're going to have people coming in showing symptoms uh, which will probably correlate quite highly to some of the symptoms we're asking. Um, on questionnaires. Um, and so that's what we were actually looking at here. Is that zero baseline correct? Because what we found, especially in our small participant pool, is that was incorrect. Um, so the main two hypotheses that we actually got out of this, um, specifically, we were looking at whether the pain population um, have significantly higher pre-exposure scores than the normal assumed baseline. Um, now, this was fairly much a given based on the work we have previously done, because in the table to the right, you can see the pre-exposure, post-exposure scores um, of the 12 participants we had in this small study. 
only two of them actually exhibited a zero baseline, meaning that every other participant actually ended with a non-zero baseline. Um, and then furthermore, we are actually looking at the differences between the assumed baseline and our actual known baseline. Um, and what we found here is that the differences between the assumed baseline and the post-exposure scores was significantly greater um, than the difference between the pre and the post-exposure scores. Um, and what this was actually trying to highlight this result is that if you use an assumption, you are going to get drastically different results than what you would actually, if you collected, say, the pre-exposure, um, what that actually indicates. We conclude from here that non-zero SSQ baselines were reported amongst main populations um, and assessing based on an assumed baseline may be incorrect, um, may incorrectly conclude that heightened cyber sickness was experienced. Um, now, there's a couple of parts with this, it's why we followed on with the survey-based study afterwards, um, which I'll flip to now. And this was a study which we conducted amongst a much more general population, and it wasn't a specific pain population. Um, so this publication, which is just coming together now, which is about to be submitted, and this is tentatively titled uh, The Simulated Sickness Questionnaire and the Erroneous Zero Baseline Assumption. Um, now, what we did here is we actually recruited just under 100 participants um, and we asked them at a time of day which would mimic uh, study conditions for a virtual reality uh, study to uh, take the simulated sickness questionnaire. Um, we were not um, eliminating participants based upon any um, health condition. Instead, what we actually did, we asked for disclosure of any uh, predetermined health conditions or uh, medication which they were taking. And therefore, we would group them afterwards as being part of either a healthy or a medical population. Um, and what we were looking for here is, is this zero baseline existing in the general population? Um, we hypothesized that it wasn't. We hypothesized based on our previous work as well that our study sample would be higher, significantly higher than our zero baseline assumption, which was correct. Um, we also hypothesized further that the healthy subpop would be uh, greater than zero baseline, which we found to be true. Similarly, for the medical subpopulation, which we found to be true once again. Um, but one thing based on our previous work, which we were looking at, or what we thought anyway, was that um, medical subpopulations, for a number of factors, um, such as medication use, uh, again, confounding with similar sickness, um, answers or questions which are being asked, um, states of the health condition itself, which may confound also, we thought that they would actually score significantly greater than healthy subpopulations total scores. Um, although we found this to be incorrect, um, if you see on the right, the violin charts at the top is the actual distributions of the participants. Um, and you can see they're actually very similar. Um, although healthy participants did on average score less than um, the medical population participants, um, it's certainly not a zero baseline and it's actually nowhere near. If you look at the table down towards the bottom, only three of our 93 participants actually did score a zero baseline. Um, the vast majority of them, you can see 73% of them actually scored higher. And then based upon the initial publications, um, categorization of how good a intervention is would be categorized as having a bad intervention. And this is pre, this is before anyone's even conducted or anyone's even gone through a virtual reality intervention. So um, it's not great um, as far as from this population anyway. Um, and what we do conclude from this is that non-zero baseline scores um, in medical and health populations uh, observed. Um, a couple of caveats again to this though, however, um, this was a predominantly student uh, population which we recruited from, and this was also during the COVID-19 um, lockdowns. So it could be said as well that people could be answering uh, more skewed towards uh, some of the questions which could be, um, for instance, difficulty focusing and fatigue based questions. Um, so that could be something to actually explore further in the future. Um, and especially as well, since there was there wasn't any priming that they were going to be experiencing a VR intervention. Um, so there could be sort of some different questions being answered there. Now I'd like to sort of flick on to what's happening now um, alongside this publication. I'm also just about to start the final study on my PhD. Um, and for this specifically, we are hopefully not doing away with the self-reports, but we're hopefully going to be start implementing some more physiological measures to infer pain and cyber sickness. Um, a lot of the literature, especially for pain and cyber sickness, suggests that we can indicate, um, maybe not at the moment how much they are experiencing, but certainly elevations of these. Um, the most proposed at the moment are with heart rate variability and electrodermal activity, um, specifically with conductance, um, although the literature will highlight that both of these are relative to pain and cyber sickness. So, especially if we have an intervention where we are trying to look at both, these two alone aren't necessarily going to be indicative of what's going on. 
So we're proposing actually including some other physiological indicators such as eye blink rate and pupil dilation, which may be better inferences of identifying what is elevated when both occur. Um, and furthermore, we're actually going to be using uh, EMG facial responses, um, specifically from corrugator and frontalis uh, muscle movement to try and indicate whether we have elevations um, in pain or cyber sickness. Um, and these will then be correlated with their self-report counterparts. Um, so also what is happening is that I'm involved in a WeCare funded project aptly titled ER for ER. Um, where we're actually looking at uh, novel applications of pain distraction within emergency room departments. Um, this is just starting at the moment, it won't conclude for about another year, um, but we are hopefully going to be incorporating as well some pain identification uh, modalities using physiological methods within an emergency room setting. Um, and I think I've sort of blitzed through that a little bit, <laughs> but I think that's most of the work that I've actually got so far. So I'm more than happy to answer any questions you might have. Um, and thank you very much. Thank you, Phil, for a very interesting talk. Um, so just to uh, ask a question about um, uh, cyber sickness. Um, it's um, something that is triggered uh, by the use of um, uh, the VR headsets yeah. and um, also what's happening in the simulated environment. But is there also something in the movement of the user that can actually um, increase uh, the experience of cyber sickness and maybe also alleviate it. So I'm thinking about particular movements of the head. Yeah, so what we actually um, also hypothesize from the cyber sickness perspective is that um, it's the, actually the imbalance. So the fact of when you have um, movement happening virtually to you, but then you're actually stood in the same place, um, your body can't actually comprehend what is happening. So it makes you feel like the stomach's almost going up inside of you because you are not able to regulate that movement to what you are seeing. Um, so what is happening now is actually some research is looking into moving platforms, for example, um, where there'll be the vibrations or movement so that it will not feel so disproportionate um, mm. between them. Okay. But we would need extra equipment for that. It's not yes, something that definitely. we could do, design as a feature of the simulated environment so that we, for instance, use head tilt to... Yeah. Uh, no, and um, again, specifically where you'll find this happening more so is, say, in environments or in applications whereby the user will not be moving of their own free will and the camera will maybe be moving through the environment for them. Again, is that displacement, that irregularity between what you are seeing and what you are feeling and then what is actually happening to your body. Um, other things that are being used, there's actually a wizard in the corner of our room where we've got walking platforms, which are hopefully alleviating this as well. Um, so not just being used these things as sort of... Uh, movement technologies for actually as a mediation as well. Um, yeah, so what kind of applications would you use in that emergency room to alleviate pain? That was what I was thinking about. So it's difficult as well. So specifically for the project that we're looking into, it will be ankle breaks dislocation. So you do not have your hands available to you. You might have an IV in one hand and your other one's broken or dislocated. Um, so at the moment, what we're exploring using, there are very passive experience with 360 videos, there are animations as well, and there are certain applications as well, which you can use eye gaze direction as well to actually navigate around it. Um, so they're not interactive, maybe in the sense of VR as we think they are. Um, however, they still need to be engaging enough because you still want to capture that sense of presence. You still want people to be engaged and again, reduce those long flexing signals. So it won't be completely passive, but it won't be as interactive as maybe what we're used to. Thank you. Uh, is it there a question in the chat. Um, so it's, uh, somebody says, thank you for sharing your insights, Phil. I work in the industry where VR and AR devices are used in support of everyday operations of business. Based on your studies, do you expect similar results for AR devices? I'm probably not the best person to speak by AR devices, unfortunately. Um, I'm not sure of myself. I haven't looked into so much of the literature, especially from a cyber sickness perspective with AR. Um, I wouldn't have thought so quite so much because you do have, especially with AR, the perspective of things around you. So like I said before about that imbalance between movement, you're actually able to regulate that a lot more, I believe, than they are. But again, I'm probably not the expert to that. Thank you. I think we have to go to the next speaker. Thank you, Phil. Thank you very much. Thank you.